Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Shimatsu's webinar on material science solutions for the pharmaceutical industry. I'm Michael Delancey, Senior Sales Representative at Shimatsu Scientific Instruments. I'll be your moderator today, and we will hear from several product specialists at Shimatsu, covering particle analysis, thermal analysis, X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy, and mechanical testing. These topics will encompass many of our material science solutions for the pharmaceutical industry. Before we start, I wanted to share a couple of notes for our viewers. The webinar console has a variety of items to help enhance your experience and interaction with us. On the screen, you'll see the following items. The presentation slides will appear on the top middle of the screen. Directly under the slides, you will see a related content list with clickable links relevant to the material being presented today. On the upper left corner is the widget for questions and answers. Please submit your questions during the presentation through this widget, and we will answer them during the Q&A session after the last presentation. Just to the right of the slides are the moderator and speaker bios. You may expand the items here to learn more about us. On the bottom left are survey questions that you may fill out anytime during or after the presentation. Finally, at the bottom of this window are the icons to bring up all these widgets in case they are minimized or hidden. All right, without further delay, let's get started. Again, if you're just joining us, I'm Michael, your moderator. Today, we'll be hearing from several Shimatsu product specialists, and our topic is material science solutions for the pharmaceutical industry. Today's speakers include Dr. William Gabler for particle size analysis, Dr. Joel Langford for X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy, Laura Mohanty for thermal analysis, and Dr. Donald Stahl for universal and mechanical testing. Now, I will hand it over to Dr. William Gabler for our first topic. Hello, and thank you for attending this webinar. My name is William Gabler. I'm an application scientist for Shimadzu's materials characterization products. Today I'll be discussing Shimadzu's laser diffraction particle size analyzers for pharmaceutical applications. So of course, many particulate substances are used and incorporated in pharmaceutical products, whether it be active ingredients, excipients and additives, uh, nanoparticles that are increasingly being used in products and processes to manufacture drugs, um, emulsions, and materials that may be undergoing aggregation or dissolution. And there are many reasons why you may need to measure particle size. For instance, you may want to be monitoring batch variation or content uniformity or process changes of a manufacturing process. Uh, you may want to measure size distribution as a critical quality attribute. Um, you may be performing research on the effects of production conditions on particle size, or perhaps studying the effect of particle size on a product's efficacy, for instance, dissolution processes, bioavailability, or you may be wanting to detect contaminants or product changes, for example, uh, subvisible particle contaminants or aggregation of uh, components due to temperature or pH. And once you've decided that you want to measure a, a material's particle size, you then have to decide how to measure it. There are many different methods available, which I've listed in the bullets on the left, um, and it's important to understand that all of these methods work differently, and as a result, each method has different trade-offs and capabilities in what they can measure. So when you're considering a particle sizing technique, you should ask yourself uh, a few questions. Specifically, what's the size range you need to measure? What kind of accuracy does the method have? What sample preparation is required? And in what state does the material have to be in to be measured? And how convenient or fast is the method? Additionally, do you need to measure particle size only or uh, other particle features such as the concentration of particles or perhaps shape or um, composition of the particles present? Today I'll be focusing on primarily laser diffraction techniques as it's one of the fastest and most convenient ways to get accurate size distributions. I'll quickly explain the principle of how it works and discuss its inclusion in several USP standards. Then give an overview of Shimadzu's product line of particle sizing instruments. Here's a schematic of a typical laser diffraction system, which is also called static light scattering. If we pass particles or say droplets in an emulsion through the path of a laser beam, the light will interact with the surface of the particles and diffract 
refract and reflect off the surface, causing a scattering pattern, which takes the form of a series of concentric circles of light. The light intensity can be measured by an array of photodetectors positioned in front of and to the side and back of the particles to collect a light intensity distribution. The scattering pattern is related to the size of the particles and the refract refractive index of the material. Through the principles of something called Mie theory and the Fraunhofer equation, the light intensities detected by the sensor can be related to a particle size distribution through calculations. In the top left, you'll see an image where the red lobe represents the theoretical light scattered light pattern for a one micron particle. In the bottom, you see the wing sensor used in Shimadzu's laser diffraction analyzers, which is made of an array of sensors starting at the point and extending out to the wings. When the scattered light is projected onto the array, we get a distribution of light related to the angle of scattering. As I said, particles of a given size and refractive index yield a unique curve of scattered intensity versus angle. The smaller particles tend to scatter at higher angles and larger particles tend to scatter at lower angles. The particle size software can then relate that light intensity to the intensity that would be caused by a distribution of spherical particles of equivalent volume. And this produces a particle size distribution along with values such as mean, median, mode, and uh, cumulative and differential distributions, which are the percentage of uh, particles at or below a certain size and the percentage of particles within a certain size range. Laser diffraction has several advantages over other sizing methods. First, it's extremely fast. Shimazu instruments can take measurements as fast as one second. This also allows the ability of making continuous measurements of a particle uh, size distribution if it were to change over time due to different conditions. You can also measure an extremely wide dynamic range from tens of nanometers to several millimeters. It shows high repeatability and you can potentially sample very large sample sizes which provide more representative distributions. And it's also very versatile, various dispersion methods, essentially any way that you can get the particles within the path of the laser, whether they be uh, dispersed in a liquid or um, dry, pass through an air, or even in high concentrations. Laser diffraction has two dedicated standards, ISO 13320 and USP 429, which I'll discuss in a little more detail in the next slide. These provide basic definitions and guidelines for using laser diffraction as a particle sizing method, and thus can apply to any application within the pharmaceutical industry to help ensure best practices and uniform data reporting. Laser diffraction is also mentioned in USP 729, globule size distributions in lipid injectables, which states that the particle size of globules and in injectables used in total parenteral nutrition therapy must be measured and limited to be below a certain size for safety reasons. While particle size is not a primary method in the next three standards, it may be a useful complementary method to provide quick estimates of particle size distributions for screening or additional information. USP 788, 787, and 789 all relate to the monitoring and identification of particular matter or contaminants in pharmaceuticals, namely injections and ophthalmic solutions. They require single particle counting techniques such as light obscuration or flow imaging and require the measurement of the number of particles within various size ranges. USP 429 and ISO 13320, which is very similar, provide guidance on performing a particle size measurement. 429 starts with the basic definition and principle of operation of a laser diffraction system, then discusses various factors relating to sampling, dispersion, and measurement procedures. For instance, particles must be dispersed without causing aggregation or comminution. A liquid dispersant should not interfere with the measurement or dissolve the particles and should be free from uh, bubbles. The addition of dispersants such as wetting agents may be required. The particles must be in a concentration that is high enough to get sufficient scattering, but not so high as to cause excess absorption or secondary scattering. Good preparation methods should result in stable and repeatable measurements. Finally, it discusses system suitability and reporting. As I mentioned previously, two of the main parameters often reported from laser diffraction systems are mean particle size the volume-based cumulative percentile sizes represented by a D subscript or X subscript. 
which represents the particle size in relation to which X percent of the distribution is smaller. For instance, a D90 of 20 microns would mean that 90% of the particles in a distribution are at or below 20 microns. Various repeatability and accuracy criteria can be established. The standard suggests for the measurement of a central value, mean or median, the coefficient of variation should be less than 10%, and 15, less than 15% for values at the edge of a distribution, such as the D10 or D90. Though these requirements will vary depending on the characteristics of the material. Since laser diffraction systems are based on physical uh, principles, they're not calibrated per se with external standards, but their operation can be checked and qualified with standardized reference standards. It's recommended that a standard with a known distribution is checked and the D50 does not exceed the known value arranged by 3% and the D10 and D90 do not exceed by 5%. It's also acceptable to use a control material that's been measured in the past to check for changes from those established values. Finally, it's also important to know that for particles below 25 microns, the selection of the refractive index values will have a great impact on the accuracy of the reported uh, distribution. So additional steps may be required to determine refractive index and absorption properties of a material um, that's being measured for the first time. Shimazu makes two laser diffraction particle size analyzers for the pharmaceutical industry. The SALT 2300 is our most versatile instrument and can measure from 17 nanometers to 2300 microns. It's compatible with four different measurement accessories. A bath sampler with a built-in sonicator, a batch cell with a stirring rod for smaller volumes, a high concentration cell, which can reduce the, the light path length and measure concentrated pastes and slurries, and a dry measurement kit to taste, test uh, dry particles as is. The SALT 7500 Bio is a laser diffraction system that was specifically designed to measure particles and aggregates in biopharmaceuticals in the subvisible particle range. Samples can be tested in a batch cell or a micro cell and it features a unique quantitative laser diffraction software that can relate scattered light intensity to particle size concentrations in the tens of microns per milliliter range. Both of these systems are compatible with Shimazu's Lab Solutions Manager for secure database management of data and 21 CFR Part 11 compliance. Lab Solutions is a robust and convenient data in integrity platform for managing results and reporting data for multiple Shimazu instruments. Finally, I'd like to mention Shimazu's flow image analysis instrument, the iSpec DIA-10. This is a microflow imaging instrument where particles in solution are passed through a microcell and each individual particle is imaged and analyzed for size and shape, providing a direct measurement of particle count and distribution. This method has been applied to USP methods previously mentioned and is also a useful tool for investigating the source and uh, shape of contaminant particles in pharmaceuticals. It can measure particle sizes from 5 to 100 microns and in volumes of 50 to 1,000 microliters. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat box and we'll respond to you shortly, either in the chat or through email at the end of the webinar. Next is a presentation by Joel Langford on X-ray fluorescence techniques. Thank you. Thank you, William. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Joel Langford. I am a product specialist in X-ray spectroscopy at Shimasu Scientific Instruments, and today I'm going to be discussing how to use X-ray fluorescence in measuring elemental impurities in pharmaceuticals. So first of all, what is X-ray fluorescence? So I want to stipulate some vocabulary here. EDX stands for energy dispersive x-rays or energy dispersive x-ray fluorescence spectroscopy. And in this talk, um, EDX and XRF are the same thing. EDX is a subset of XRF, but in the context of this talk, XRF and EDX can be used interchangeably. So in EDX, you have an x-ray tube. It emits polychromatic x-ray radiation that is incident upon the sample. And these polychromatic x-rays they will excite the atoms uh, that the sample is composed of. And as a result of this electronic excitation, the, the atoms will relax, electronically react, relax to a lower energy state. The resulting relaxation process produces another X-ray, 
another secondary x-ray that is also called a fluorescent x-ray. Now, the fluorescent x-ray energy is dependent or is characteristic upon which atom it came from. So, for example, there is a characteristic fluorescent x-ray for aluminum, for chromium, for lead, and for the rest of the elements. So what you can do is you can measure a photon energy discriminating detector, in this case a silicon drift detector, to measure essentially the X-ray energy spectrum, the emission spectrum, the fluorescence spectrum. So on the cartoon to the right, you have a cartoon fluorescent X-ray spectrum where the horizontal axis is energy, emitted energy. So for example, aluminum emits secondary X-rays or fluorescent X-rays at 1.487 kilo electron volts, chromium is at 5.412 kilo electron volts, and so on. So the horizontal axis is used to distinguish individual elements, where the y-axis is correlated with concentration. So the higher the intensity, the more of the higher the concentration of that element within the sample. This is a picture of a Shimatsu energy dispersive X-ray fluorescence spectrometer. So there's an X-ray tube. It's a 50 watt, uh, 50 watt rhodium X-ray tube with a silicon drift detector. Now, what really sets us apart is the CMOS camera, which is used to take a picture every time a measurement is made, a picture of the sample that is, a collimator which chokes down the X-ray beam to a particular spot on the sample. And what's actually really crucial and what really sets us apart is the filters. The filters are uh, somewhat crucial, they're very crucial actually, for pharmaceutical elemental impurity analysis. So in short, what filters do is they, um, they reduce the background of noise background or anom the background from Compton and Ray Rayleigh scattering or anomalous experts off the sample for a particular element energy range. So there's a filter for lead, a filter for mercury, a filter for iridium and rhodium and so forth. And so what these filters essentially do is because they reduce background, they overall increase detection limits between a factor to an order of magnitude. Shimatsu's energy dispersive X-ray fluorescence spectrometers can also be equipped with an auto sampler, a 12 position auto sampler that is designed to fit a variety of XRF sample cups. What's nice about the auto sampler is is um, you, first of all, you can continuously measure replicates and different samples without ever coming back to the instrument. It's automated. But what's also very nice is that you can set different cups in there that have samples meant for different methods. So you can have a cup at position one where the material, where you want to know the lead content in the material, for example. Another cup where you have a method where that is specifically optimized for, let's say, the detection of noble metals like iridium and platinum. So this can all be set up in a queue, in a method queue, such that essentially when the method is set up, you never have to return to the instrument. What you see here is a periodic table of the elements, and the, the standard EDX spectrometer uh, for Shimatsu is called the EDX7000, which can measure an element range from, on the periodic table from sodium to uranium. Now, in general, the lighter the element, the higher the detection limit or the lower the sensitivity is that the, EDX, that the EDX is towards that particular element. So, for example, sodium has a detection limit of nominally around 100 ppm, uh, whereas the heavier elements like mercury and lead have detection limits that are oftentimes below one part per million. What you see here is another periodic table. Now, this periodic table highlights the elements that are oftentimes, uh, how is the best way to put it? Th these are elements that are of particular interest as elemental impurities in pharmaceutical products, and for example, APIs. And so <clears throat> these are the elements specified by the International Center for Harmonization Q3D guidelines. There are the class one elements, uh, notorious, sometimes notoriously called the big four. These are things like lead, mercury, cadmium, and uh, arsenic. There's the class two elements uh, that are more like the noble metals, oftentimes used in organometallic uh, catalysts, for example, rhodium, palladium, platinum, and so forth. 
all the elements can be detected by the EDX bar the class three element lithium. So this is a picture of EDX uh, in comparison to other elemental techniques, primarily ICPMS and ICPAS. Now, anyone who does elemental impurity analysis in the pharmaceutical realm is, is probably very familiar with USP 233, which is the chapter that provides the guidelines for elemental impurity analysis using plasma-based techniques like ICPMS and ICPAS. There is an addendum to USP 233 called USP 735, which acts as, um, which, can, which basically says that EDX can be used as an alternative to ICPMS and ICPAS as a tool for elemental impurity analysis in pharmaceuticals. So it is worth it to compare uh, on this basis alone, the EDX with the ICPMS. So in general, EDX, the EDX can accept many forms of samples. This includes powders, solids, and liquids. In ICPMS, the, the, the sample has to be in an aqueous state. It has to be in a slightly acidified liquid state. Now, often a critique of EDX is that it's not sensitive enough for pharmaceutical elemental impurity analysis, oftentimes because they say that the detection limits are, you know, in the part per million range, whereas the ICPMS is in the part per trillion range. However, these are the essentially sensitivity of the instrument itself. It does not take into account the method detection limits. In ICPMS, if you want to measure a powder, in particular a powder or even a very, um, a very non, uh, like a gel, for example, or a, uh, a gel, for example, a viscous liquid, you oftentimes have to digest it followed by diluting, and the dilution factor can be anywhere between 10 to 500. And so with those two, you know, extra steps involved, oftentimes the method detection limit basically increases to the point where the ICPMS method detection limit is on par with the EDX method detection limit. <clears throat> In EDX, there's very little pretreatment for samples. You basically put your material into a container or even inside the um, EDX sample chamber, and that's often adequate enough. In ICPMS, if you want to measure powders or, or viscous liquids, they oftentimes have to be put into a microwave digester or a digestion block. You have to work it up with acid. Hydrofluoric acid sometimes has to be used. The measurement time is long, EDX. It, it, it can be seconds to minutes to hours. It depends on the element, depends on the sensitivity, depends on the matrix that, that it's in. Uh, it depends on many factors. Um, the, the nice thing is that the consumable load on EDX is not nearly as expensive as that as the ICPMS. Uh, the ICPMS consumes, uh, for example, it can con consume a lot of disposable in the form of glassware and, for example, uh, tubes uh, and also electricity. The electricity consumption on ICPMS is much higher than that of the EDX. Another major consumable used in ICPMS for the torch, for the plasma itself, is argon. In EDX, electricity consumption is that of a desktop computer, and there's no need for, for liquid or, or li for gaseous argon. You basically can measure, if you want to, you can measure the sample in atmosphere. So this is what we hear from our customers. These are the benefits of using EDX. Um, there's no need for frequent workup of, like, for example, an API. Um, it's often just there's very short amount of time working in front of the instrument. It's, it, it's a very streamlined process, and it's also cost-saving in that regard, both costs in terms of time and money. <clears throat> it's easy to measure elements that are difficult to measure by ICPMS. These are primarily things like the chalcogens, like sulfur, uh, phosphorus, and chlorine. Uh, there's no need to make a calibration curve every time with EDX. Oftentimes curves last for months to years and only what is only needed is a, is a periodic check of the curve. Rapid startup with EDX, it oftentimes only takes uh, a minute, a few minutes to turn on the EDX. There's no waste generated in EDX. A small amount of sample is needed in EDX, oftentimes 0.1 grams 
um, is, is all that is needed for an accurate analysis by EDX. This is particularly really important, the small amount, in uh, research and discovery departments of pharmaceutical companies because often these departments are synthesizing small amounts of material, like, for example, small molecule drugs, and they need to save the sample for, for all sorts of forms of analysis. And EDX is non-destructive, and it, it doesn't it doesn't consume, it, and you only need a small amount of samples. So that's those are two pluses, particularly from the perspective of research and discovery. Many elements can be measured simultaneously. There's not too much of a need uh, for contamination and low running costs uh, compared to ICPMS. There's no argon, uh, and the electricity consumption is 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 minimal when compared to that of an ICPMS. This slide shows a general workup of um, how a powder sample like an API would be analyzed using uh, an energy dispersive X-ray fluorescence spectrometer. So you have the powder. You can put the powder directly into a cup and basically put the cup directly onto the sample turret. And provided that the software, the method in the software has been made, for example, a method for lead or a method for cadmium um, or a method for the big four or whatever, provided that that method has been made, you can, all you have to do is essentially hit the start button. And uh, this process, especially compared to other techniques, the aforementioned techniques, uh, is, it's a very streamlined process. Anyone can basically do it provided that the method has been made. And it saves a lot of cost, it, uh, particularly in terms of consumable content and, uh, and, and, other, and other aspects. So here's a picture of uh, two APIs, the Nasopil hydrochloride and Catropil. And so, for example, what we were interested in, in measuring in these two APIs is actually the normal metals because oftentimes it's necessary for these small molecule drugs. Uh, part of the synthesis step involves some sort of organometallic noble metal type catalyst. And so what you want to do is make sure in the final product, or in the API in this case, that there's very little or basically no detectable amount of, of these uh, noble metals inside the API. So what you can do is you can take the drug substance, the API, and spike it with an ICP standard that contains iridium, platinum, rhodium, the rest of the noble elements. And you take that spike sample and simply, let, like the unspiked sample, you put it directly into the sample cup and measure it with the EDX. Note that if you wanted to do ICPMS with this spike sample, it would have to be digested and diluted, followed by ICPMS. Here's a table that compares the correlation between EDX and ICPMS. Now, first of all, I want to mention that this comes from an application note and a white paper, and um, that goes into more detail with regards to the method development and uh, some of the data analysis and so forth. So if you're interested in that white paper or that application note, please get into contact with either myself or your nearest Shimatsu representative, and we'll be happy to provide the white paper and application note. I also want to mention that in this white paper and application note, this, this table compares only the class two elements. However, in the white note, we also compare the big four, the class one elements, the lead, mercury, arsenic, uh, and cadmium. So for both of the APIs, the correlation between the EDX and the ICPMS is very high. It's basically to within the PPM level. There's a high degree of agreeability or correlation between the EDX and the ICPMS method. <clears throat> this is an interesting sample. This is uh, the API benazepyl hydrochloride. And what we did is we took a very minimal small amount of sample 200 milligrams, and put it into a sample cup that's designed for low sample volumes, called a micro X cell. We set it in the instrument. The goal of this analysis was actually to measure chlorine content without external standards, unlike the previous method with the noble metals where we had to spike the powder to get a number, to get a quantitative number from, from the analysis. And this method, we're using a standardless method called the fundamental parameter method to measure the chlorine content in benazepyl hydrochloride. And in this case, not using 
fundamental parameters, the chlorine content we got was 7.51%. The actual content of this API is 7.69%. So uh, nominally within 0.3% of each other, 0 0.2 to 0.3%. This is a table that shows chlorine content analysis done using stat the standard list fundamental parameter method in various APIs. So what the green, <clears throat> the green columns are, sorry, the green rows are, they are the quantitative values measured by the EDX without using standards. So for example, benazepil hydrochloride has an actual value of 7.69%, whereas the um, value measured by the EDX is 7.51%, and the rest of the APIs. So this method um, nominally gives you a value of an accuracy or basically the degree of difference between the actual value and the quantitative value determined by the EDX is within a percent. Uh, this could be useful as a screening tool, for example, or like some sort of QA protocol where if, you ha if, you're, on a, if you're checking a, uh, some sort of API, for example, the chlorine content, and if it's, um, if it's too high or too low, you can use a more, uh, a more precise method that, for example, involves the use of standards, a standard calibration curve with EDX, uh, to, to verify the, the not passing sample, the too high or too low, for example, in chlorine content API. With the EDX, we offer a variety of accessories that are curtailed for pharmaceutical analysis. One of them is called, maybe redundantly speaking, it's called the Pharmaceutical Impurities Analysis Method Package. What this is, is it's a, um, a, it's a software suite that comes with methods that are curtailed, that are optimized for the detection and quantification of class one and class two elements that are specified by the ICH Q3D guidelines. This is nice to have because oftentimes it will bypass a lot of, in this case, method development. We even have, um, with one of our partners that specs sample prep, they even provide standards, calibration standards, um, that can be used in conjunction with this pharmaceutical impurity analysis method package. Our EDX systems can also be um, combined with Shimatsu's Lab Solutions DBCS software suite. So this is necessary to obtain 21 CFR Part 11 compliance, which our EDX system can do. This, th these will, this compliance is necessary for uh, laboratories and sites that require some degree of traceability, data security, uh, validation, PDF output, and so forth. So in essence, our, 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 our EDX can be, can be combined with lab solutions to make the system 21 CFR Part 11 compliant. I leave with this back note that the importance of elemental impurity control in medicines is increasing against the backdrop of the release of ICH Q3D guidelines. Shimatsu's EDX systems offer a simple and fast solution for elemental analysis of medicines in accordance with these guidelines. Thank you for your time, and I'm going to hand it off to Laura Mahatney, who will be discussing using thermal analysis techniques on materials that are relevant for the pharmaceutical industry. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Hi, everyone. My name is Laura Mahanti. I'm a technical support engineer for Shimatsu Scientific Instruments, and today I will be talking about thermal analysis instruments for pharmaceutical applications using the DSC and the TGA. So this presentation for the outline will include a brief introduction to thermal analysis in plastics packaging and its role in pharmaceuticals. Then we will discuss polymers and the different types of polymers used in thermal analysis testing. And then we will focus on USP 661.1, which is thermal analysis methods for specific materials and packaging. Followed by that, we will go over lots of examples with DSC and TGA, which include finding the melting temperature of aspirin, 
and interactions with different types of drugs, followed by glass transitions and melting temperature of glucose aqueous solution. And then we will go over material identification example between LDPE and HDPE, as well as molecular weight, um, finding the molecular weight changes for polyethylene glycol, or PEG. And then for TGA, we'll discuss a few weight loss examples with TGA. And then for the last example, we will discuss predicting weight loss using TGA um, using various decomposition rates. Followed by that will be lab solutions discussion, which is a software which is used in integration with our instruments. And so there are three different versions of lab solutions, and they have different features. So we will discuss those and compare those, followed by a summary of this presentation. Plastics packaging for pharmaceutical use include bottles, inhalers, syringes, vials, baths, and tubing. Plastic materials that are commonly used in packaging systems include polyethylene, polypropylene, cyclic olefins, PET, PETG, polyvinyl chloride, and other commodity thermoplastics. Thermal analysis has a critical role in pharmaceuticals. Drug products can chemically interact with packaging materials and components of construction while the product is being manufactured, shipped, stored, or administered. And because these pharmaceutical drugs contain API or active pharmaceutical ingredients, these interactions with packaging material are going to be inevitable. However, these interactions must not adversely affect the efficiency of the drug product or the packaging system. Any adverse interactions can compromise patient safety. Thermal analysis is one characterization technique used to verify drug product performance and packaging performance. There are many different types of tested polymers used in thermal analysis, and some examples include ABS, nylon, PTFE, polyethylene, PET, polypropylene, and PVC. Um, various types of commodity thermoplastics and thermosets are tested. Here is an excerpt taken from USP 661.1, which talks about the various thermal analysis methods. And so in the beginning, they talk about sample preparation before testing. And then followed by that, they discuss the procedure for various different types of polymers. Uh, for example, polyethylene, they talk about the program uh, conditions, the heating rate, and the temperature range. They also discuss similar um, heating profiles for polyethylene terephthalate, G, um, PET, cyclic olefin, polypropylene, and plasticized polyvinyl chloride, and other materials. We talked about the different types of polymers tested using thermal analysis and its role in pharmaceuticals. So now we'll be discussing the instrumentation. And so one instrumentation is the differential scanning calorimetry, or the DSC. And it's a DSC is a thermal analysis technique used to measure difference in heat flow when it undergoes temperature change, to, and we can obtain information on glass transition, melting, percent crystallinity of thermoplastics, degree of cure of thermosets, purity analysis, material identification, solvent determination, and polymorphism. Here's the most common application for DSC in measuring melting temperature. So here's a melting of aspirin. And as we can see here, melting is usually taken as the onset. So the onset of melting in this case is 135.9 C for aspirin. And the heat flow or the energy required to heat the material to this phase is 167.03 joules per gram. One other application for DSC is looking at drug interactions. And so for this example, we have benzoic acid and magnesium oxide. Magnesium oxide alone, as you can see, is a flat baseline. There is nothing on the thermogram that shows any reaction. However, with benzoic acid, we see that there is a melting temperature, onset of melting around 122.7 C. When you combine a one-to-one -one ratio of MGO and benzoic acid, we do get a exothermic event, and we also get a peak at 111.5 C.
One of the most common uses for DSC is measuring the glass transition and melting. So for this example, we have a 60% glucose aqueous solution. So the glass transition temperature, or the TG, is the inflection point at the beginning of a thermogram that measures around eight, minus 89 C. And followed by that is the peak crystallization temperature, which is a exothermic reaction, and that is occurring around minus 36 C. Immediately after that is in a melting stage, and so that's the melting temperature at minus 22.7 C. The fact that you have the heat of fusion of both crystallization and melting that are similar to each other and very close to each other shows that there was a very quick sample transformation that went from a crystalline state to an amorphous state. Another use for DSC is material identification. So for this example, we have two polymers. We have LDPE and HDPE, and we can use those as an overlay of the thermogram to find the melting temperature and identify the thermoplastic. So you can see here that HDPE has the higher glass transition and melting temperature compared to LDPE. Here's an example of molecular weight for polyethylene glycol. As you can see, as the molecular weight increases, the melting temperature also increases. And that's because as you increase the molecular weight of a polymer, you create more entanglements in the polymer chain. And if you increase uh, the entanglements, you block segmental motion, so you're increasing the glass transition temperature, or the TG, and therefore you're also increasing the melting temperature. We discussed some examples of DSC, and now we'll talk about thermogravimetric analysis, or TGA. TGA is a thermal analysis technique that measures weight loss as a function of temperature and time. Some examples of what TGA measures include weight loss, determination of degradation temperature prior to running a DSC, material identification, oxidation studies, and measuring activation energy. TGA is often used to investigate dehydration or decomposition processes of the compound. It provides also useful information on sample drying at fixed temperature. The measurements can be carried out in controlled atmosphere to reveal interactions with drug substances and or active substances and excipients or packaging materials. Most important, TGA is useful because it's often used before a DSC to determine the maximum temperature at which the DSC can operate. So for example, if you have an unknown material before running a DSC, you can run a TGA on it, find out where the material starts to degrade, and then use that temperature to use as a um, maximum temperature range for a DSC because you cannot use a DSC to degrade a material because that can ruin the cell. So very often for unknown materials, you can use a TGA first. Here's an example of sodium tartrate weight loss. We can see here there's weight loss in two stages. The first is a 15% weight loss, which indicates desorption of water molecules. And then there's a second weight loss, which is around 240 C, and that shows the decomposition of the material. Another weight loss example is with cyclodextrin. And here we see that there's, again, multiple stages of weight loss. The first one is at 11% weight loss, which indicates the release of water, which was previously retained by the cyclodextrin ring structure. And then followed by that is the decomposition, which occurs at around 250 C. Certain materials will take a very long time to decompose. In that case, Shimatsu offers a kinetic analysis software used to evaluate these very slow rates of reaction. To determine these slow rates of reaction, you need to measure the activation energy. And in to, order to do that, we have to use a Azua plot, which is basically a plot that uh, graphs the heating rate versus the inverse of temperature. From there, you measure the slope, and from there, you can obtain the activation energy. Once the activation energy is known, then you can measure the decomposition time and that can be estimated using the equation below. This equation is based on the Arrhenius equation, which is frequently used in kinetic analysis for rates of reaction. Here's one example of cyclobarbital, and we have an overlay 
of the, therm the thermogram at different heating rates of 3, 5, 7.5, and 10 C per minute. We overlay that and then we measure the slope of each curve and take the average. That slope indicates the activation energy. And once we measure that, we take the average and then we use that as the main activation energy value. Once we measure the average activation energy based on the different heating rates, we can use the formula and plug it in and find that at 30 C, the material would decompose at 20% in 421 years. So yes, this kinetic software is very useful for materials with very slow reaction processes. We showed some examples of DSC and TGA and their different applications. So now we are going to discuss the lab solution software, which is used with the thermal analysis instruments. And that is lab solutions TA, DB, and CS. Lab solutions has many benefits, particularly in the pharma industry. It is compatible with ERES regulations, such as FDA 21, CFR Part 11 compliance, as well as other GMP regulations. Its customized security features can now be integrated with thermal instruments. Audit trails ensure traceability and the ability to connect to multiple instruments and check the status at one time. Automatic analysis and report preparation can be performed by configuring the template in the acquisition program prior to the test. Lab Solutions TA is the most basic software that we have for Lab Solutions, and that has um, basically one PC connected to multiple different instruments. The data files are saved and managed in a folder on the PC, and there is no user management. The software is recommended for people who would prefer the same method as before, and for people who use the system only occasionally. We, there is an improved interface which allows for easier accessibility between instruments. Lab Solutions Database, or Lab Solutions DB, provides secure data management on a single PC. It integrates data management functions into the Lab Solutions CA software and is compatible with FDA 21 CFR Part 11, GMP, and other regulations. It's recommended for customers who do not require a network and want ERES compliance only for standalone systems. With Lab Solutions CS, the analysis data is managed with the database on a server computer. The data is read from any computer on the network. Lab Solutions CS is recommended if there are many users and the customer wants ERES compatibility. Here is a chart that compares the different versions of Lab Solutions between TA, DB, and CS. So as we can see, TA does not have a database. There is no user management, rights group management, or project management included, and it is a standalone. Um, it's used as standalone. Whereas with the Lab Solutions DB, you do have access to a database, and you have rights group and project management ability as well. And you can also, um, with the Lab Solutions CS, you have it's used over a network. Whereas with DB. And with TA, these are used in standalone mode. So to summarize, we talked about DSC and TGA, which are thermal analysis techniques used to characterize drug products and associated packaging materials. Thermal analysis helps us to understand the interaction between packaging and the drug product um, and provides us information on its efficiency, safety, and longevity. When we test for unknown materials, we can use TGA before a DSC because TGA determines the decomposition, and we can use that information of decomposition to set parameters for a DSC. And then last, we talked about lab solutions, which offers an array of options based on customer requirements. In addition to being compatible with FDA 21, CFR Part 11, it also meets other GMP regulations. 
And Lab Solutions offers customers customized levels of security based on its organizational needs. That concludes the presentation for thermal analysis and its role in pharmaceutical applications using the DSC and the TGA. Here are some references used in this presentation. And with that being said, thank you so much for watching. And I'm going to hand it over to Donald Stull, who will be talking about mechanical testing for pharmaceutical applications. Physical Strength Testing for Pharmaceuticals. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Donald Stahl, Product Coordinator for Universal Testing Instruments at Shimadzu Scientific Instruments. Today, we will be discussing Shimadzu's Universal Testing Instruments and their applications in the pharmaceutical industry. Most people are aware that the pharmaceuticals industry is very heavily regulated, and we all expect that the pharmaceuticals are tested for purity, contaminants, composition, etc. However, people are generally less aware that mechanical tests are conducted to confirm the physical characteristics of these products. Nevertheless, it is expected that these products will perform exactly as they are intended. Imagine a hypodermic needle breaking during an injection or a nurse straining with all of her might to depress a syringe. Imagine an impenetrable injection vial. Imagine your prescription capsules arriving broken or crushed. At the very least, this will incept doubt about the product into a consumer. However, these failures or defects could lead to costly recalls, investigations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The good news is that testing the physical characteristics of pharmaceuticals, drug delivery systems, and medical devices is relatively straightforward. Testing can occur at the developmental stages or post-production for quality assurance purposes. With the right universal testing instrument, you can test according to specific standards and evaluate your products for conformity. So here on the right, we have a few examples illustrating tests for tablets, capsules, needles, and syringes. The universal testing instrument measures force as a function of displacement. From that data, we can make calculations and interpretations to quantify the physical characteristics of these products. So let's look a bit deeper at these examples. This first example is a tablet compression test. In this method, a tablet is placed between two plates and compressed at a constant rate of speed until it fractures. The force first displacement plot on the right shows the results. You will notice a rise in force, a peak, and a drop in force. The rise in force corresponds to the compression or loading of the tablet. The peak represents the initial fracture, and the drop in force corresponds to the tablet being crushed. The resulting peak value gives us the tablet's fracture strength and can be useful for evaluating the hardness, powder molding, and surface coating characteristics of these tablets. The instrument used in this example can be prepared with various types of and sizes of compression probes to accommodate different tablet sizes and shapes. This next example shows a test for press through packaging. In this test, the force necessary to eject tablets or capsules out of the packaging is measured. This test is useful for determining the ejection force, but can also be useful for determining the durability of the packaging and its contents. This test is similar to the previous example in that the peak value is reported, but in this case, the peak value represents the ejection force. The testing instrument is equipped with a special jig that utilizes various removable adapters shown in the upper right corner. By replacing adapters, the specialized press-through jig can accommodate various shapes and sizes of tablets and press-through packaging. Our next example shows the needle insertion test. In this test, a needle punctures a material stretched over a hollow cavity. The needle continues through the material until the shaft is fully inserted. In this case, we get multiple peaks attributed to the different facets of the needle. For example, we see a localized peak from when the point first penetrates or the point puncture force, another peak as the heel passes through or the heel puncture force, and a third peak from when the end of the bevel punctures the material, the bevel puncture force. 
Finally, we see some oscillations of the force attribu attributed to the frictional forces between the shaft and the material. This test is used to evaluate the force required to pierce a vial cap, films, and personal protective equipment, or for development of bevel profiles to improve patient comfort. Variables such as the target material, needle size, and cavity size can be adjusted to evaluate the insertion force. This example of a syringe extrusion test is very common. In this test, the syringe is fixed in place and the plunger is de depressed at a constant rate. This test shows two distinct regions and peaks. One peak is associated with the force required to start depressing the plunger. This is often referred to as the break loose force. The next section shows the force changes as the plunger is depressed and the pressure builds in the syringe. The peak in this region is often referred to as the glide force. This test is used to ensure that the syringe operates smoothly while the drug is administered to the patient. A specialized syringe extrusion jig shown in the picture uses adapters to accommodate a variety of syringe diameters and lengths. This final example shows a peel test for an adhesive bandage. The tabs of the bandage packaging are secured in grips and pulled apart. This test is useful for determining if the bandage is accessible to a majority of the population with varying degrees of strength and dexterity. The static force shown shows the force required to initiate the package separation. And the dynamic force is associated with the average force to continue peeling the package apart. Other physical properties such as the bandage's adhesiveness, tensile strength, and tear strength can be determined with a similar configuration. So now that we have seen various examples of physical strength testing, you may ask yourself, what equipment do I need to conduct these types of tests myself? Three main components are a universal test frame, load cell, and fixtures or jigs. The test frame is the main component. It applies the load to the sample, controls the test speed, and measures the displacement. The load cell measures the force applied to the sample. And finally, the fixtures translate the load to the sample. If you are considering to perform your own physical strength tests, there are a few questions you will want to consider before you configure your system. When selecting a test frame, it is important to make sure you understand the parameters and measurement requirements of your test. For example, what speed do I need to test? And can this instrument achieve that speed? The next point is capacity. What is the maximum force and can this instrument apply that much force? The next component to consider is the load cell. You will wanna understand the minimum and maximum force you need to measure to characterize your material. In other words, what force range do I need? You will also want to consider what jigs you will need to perform your test. The jigs ensure that you are applying the load in a way that generates meaningful data. So you should ask yourself, what specific test do I need to perform? What measurement do I want to make? What do the standards require? And will my sample fit in the fixture? And finally, are there any other specific requirements for your test? For example, do I need to test at an elevated temperature? Or do I need to test in an aqueous solution? These are all important criteria to define before you consider a purchase. Shimazu has been manufacturing test frames for over 100 years and offers a wide variety of universal testing instruments. Our electromechanical systems include the Shimazu AGXV, AGSX, and EZX. Our AGXV is Shimazu's flagship model of test frame for the most demanding applications, such as CFRP testing and cutting edge research and development. The AGSX is Shimazu's economical test frame designed for routine analysis. And finally, the EZX is Shimazu's compact, low capacity test frame best suited for testing pharmaceuticals and medical devices. The EZX series is available in three varieties, the EZSX, EZLX, and EZLX High Speed. 
The Easy SX and Easy LX are virtually identical except for the span and capacity. The Easy SX has a maximum span of 500 millimeters and a maximum capacity of 500 newtons. The Easy LX has a longer maximum span of 920 millimeters and a maximum capacity of 5,000 newtons. And finally, the Easy LX high speed has the same span as the Easy LX 920 millimeters, but a reduced capacity of 2,500 newtons, and of course, twice the crosshead speed of the Easy SX and LX. All three models are controlled with Shimazu's Trapezium software. Finally, Shimazu's test frame software is compatible with Shimazu's Lab Solutions lab management platform. This platform provides electronic records, electronic signature, regulatory compliance, and enables confident, reliable data management for FDA 21 CFR Part 11. Lab Solutions AG is supported on Lab Solutions client server and database managers, so it can be operated from a single management computer or connected to a server where testing and approvals can be performed from separate locations. Let's thank each of our speakers for an informative presentation. Again, under the related contents list, you can obtain more details about our material science solutions and instruments. If you have not had a chance, please fill out the survey questions on the left-hand side to provide feedback and request additional information. Of course, please feel free to contact me directly via email or phone regarding any of our material science instruments. Okay, thank you all again for excellent presentations. At this time, uh, we will begin our Q&A session. Thank you to the audience for attending and for sending in some great questions. We have time for a few questions. Um, here's a good one. I'm gonna address this one to, uh, to Joel for it's an EDX question. Uh, what are some typical measuring times for EDX analysis? Uh, hi, Mike. Uh, yeah, this is an excellent question. And in short, it really depends. Now, usually for what I would call most typical analysis in my experience is that an average measurement time is normally um, several minutes to 10 minutes. So let's say, five to 10 minutes. And for example, in the, in, the, uh, in the talk, when determining the chlorine content in different APIs, that was done in around 10 minutes. For the USP 233-735 application, Elemental Impurity Analysis and Pharmaceutical Products, those guidelines are very, um, how to say it, specific and even to some extent stringent. And the reason is, is that the limit of quantification or the limit of detection is, has to be very uh, low. And so typically for elemental impurity analysis by USP 735, um, the analysis time is between an hour to two hours per sample? Yeah, great question. Thanks, Joel. Um, here, here's another question. This one came in uh, regarding thermal analysis. So I'm gonna throw this question to, uh, to Laura. <laughs> um, what are the best methods for checking the calibration and verification uh, of the DSC and the TGA thermal analyzer? That's an excellent question, Mike. So for the DSC, you would have to verify the heat flow. And so typically um, for that, you would use an indium standard, which is very common um, to verify that. And so for the DSC, you can also measure any type of standard you can use that with the very high metal content that's like 99.9% .9 pure, like tin or zinc. Um, depending on what standard you use will depend on the temperature range of what your application is. 
So if you're testing at a higher temperature range on a DSC, you might want to use a standard at a higher temperature. Um, and those are readily available. And also for the TGA, typically mass is verified through um, calcium oxalate to verify uh, mass loss. And then also for the TGA to verify temperature, um, we have nickel standards to use to measure the carry point of nickel. So those are some examples that you can use on the DSC and TGA. Thanks, Laura. Um, okay, here's another good question. This one I'm going to address to uh, William for uh, particle size analysis. Um, the various measuring units uh, that you presented, uh, how long does it take to switch between the various measuring units, the wet measuring system and the dry measuring system? Hey, Mike, great question. So all of those Thanks. components are very easy to switch out. They basically each each cell holder clips into place within the chamber of the salt, and um, so they can each be switched out in just a matter of minutes. And we also have some instructional videos to, to demonstrate that, so it's very easy to do. Okay, perfect. Um, here's another really good question regarding the um, uh, EZX universal tester. Um, I'm gonna ask Donald to address this one. Um, Given the wide range of materials and samples that can be tested on the universal tester, can various load cells be user exchanged for the various measuring ranges? Yeah, Mike, that's actually a, a really good point. So um, depending on the test that you're performing and, and what the maximum force that you'll need to apply is, you might want to use uh, a different capacity of load cell in different circumstances. And with our instruments, um, you can exchange the load cells um, anywhere from, you know, like a one newton load cell all the way up to a five kilonewton load cell uh, in the case of like an easy LX, for example. Perfect, perfect. Um, it looks like we are at the end of our allocated time for the webinar. I want to thank you all again for the interesting questions. Uh, since we don't have time to answer all of the remaining questions, we will reach out to everyone individually, and to each of you, we'll answer your questions that we were not able to answer uh, today during the webinar. Uh, once again, thank you all for attending and participating. We will send you an email with a link to view a recorded version of this presentation anytime. So thank you again for attending. Have a great day, and we appreciate you uh, joining us for the webinar.